My name is Jenna Weiss. I'm the Associate Director of Public Programs here at the Jewish Museum, and it's truly my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's dialogue and discourse, Designs for Modern Living. Tonight's panel is held in conjunction with the exhibition Mood of the Moment, Gabby Aguillon and the House of Chloe, the first museum exhibition to honor the visionary Jewish entrepreneur Gabby Aguillon and her legacy. We still have a few upcoming programs planned both virtually and on site, and just to name a few, next Thursday, December 7th at 6.30 p.m., legendary fashion icon Pat Cleveland will be in conversation with guest curator Shoakat Kazarian. And on January 25th, Kazarian uh, joins Chloe archivist Geraldine Sommier and fashion writer Dal Shoda for a conversation about the role of the archive. For full details about all of our upcoming programs, please visit our website to sign up for our e-news. And before I introduce our speakers, I would like to thank the whole curatorial team for this exhibition, led by Claudia Gould with Christina Parsons and Shoakat Kazarian, who is here joining us tonight. The exhibition catalog and related publications are uh, available in our shop downstairs after the talk, and the galleries will be open until about 8 p.m., so if you haven't had a chance to visit, you can quickly run through after the program. And now I'd like to briefly introduce our speakers, beginning with tonight's moderator, Avery Truffleman, who I would also like to thank for all of her work conceiving this panel. Uh, Truffleman is the host and creator of Articles of Interest, which was named one of the top podcasts of the year by The New Yorker. Articles of Interest seeks to take the world of clothing and make it accessible and thought-provoking to everyone, which earned Truffleman a spot on the Business of Fashions list of the 500 most important people in fashion. Elizabeth Evitz Dickinson is a journalist and author whose writing about architecture, design, and culture has been featured in The New Yorker, The New York Times, Harper's, and Washington Post Magazine, among many others. She is working on a forthcoming book about Claire McCardle, the trailblazing designer who revolutionized American fashion and helped women live more independent lives. Alexandra Lang is a design critic and author of Meet Me by the Fountain, an inside history of the mall. She is also co-author with Jane Thompson of Design Research, the store that brought modern living to American homes, about the store that brought Marimekko to America. And finally, Dr. Alexis Romano teaches fashion studies at Parsons, the new school for design. Her work explores 20th century fashion, photography, gender, and the everyday. She is the author of Pret a Porter, Paris and Women, a Cultural Study of French Ready-Made Fashion, 1945 to 68. And her exhibition, Staten Island Mode, Identity, Memory, and Fashion, is now on view at the Newhouse Center for Contemporary Art. So with that, I'd like to ask you to take a moment to silence your cell phones and join me in welcoming Avery Truffleman, Elizabeth Evitz Dickinson, Alexand Alexandra Lang, and Alexis Romano. So the way tonight's going to work is, um, well, yeah, when Jenna reached out, I was so excited to do something in cahoots with uh, this amazing exhibit, which is right next door, about Chloe. And as soon as I started reading a little bit more about Chloe, I was like, you know what's really interesting is that this designer was working through a lot of similar uh, thoughts, visual, like, you know, big pockets, wrap dresses, like major, like huge patterns, big colors. There are a lot of um, design and intellectual similarities with Marimekko and Claire McCardle. And it's so interesting that these three designers, you know, in France, in Finland, and in the United States kind of came to such similar places uh, across such wide ranges of geography. So we're gonna do like a little round robin and give like little presentations about each designer so you can kind of know where each is coming from and then we're gonna talk a little bit together and then you can, you know, watch all the presentations, come to your own conclusions, come up with your own questions and we will have a little bit of time for questions at the end. Um, but I will just start by saying, um, uh, I'll give a little bit of a, of a overview. Um, 
but you know, in a lot of history of dress, I think we tend to assume that the history of dress, not unlike the way history is conceived of, is like one straight line. You know, we were this way, and then we were this way, and then we were this way, and then we were this way. Like the 60s look like this, the 70s look like that, the 80s look like that. It's very easy to like make those assessments in hindsight, but it is very rare in the moment to actually feel like anyone dresses any one certain way, except sometimes it is easy. But most of the time, <laughs> it's, uh, you know, not everyone dresses in one way. And so you have to consider that, you know, this linear march of fashion is not exactly the way it goes. I mean, if you consider that like around here, I think, yeah, uh, that's around when uh, suffragists started wearing bloomers, you know, like that was also happening around that time. Um, and so there are always these like undercurrents and these threads that sort of challenge the status quo and push it into modernity. So to understand sort of where Chloe began and where it came from, um, I mean, you have to kind of get into the 20th century. And it's no secret that in the 1920s, you know, the silhouettes loosened, skirts got shorter, uh, women over the age of 21 were finally allowed to vote in 1928, they were granted the same rights as men, there was this like loosening of style. And so again, with like the linear progression of fashion, you'd think like, oh wow, you know, the march of progress, we're only getting better and better and better. And you can see this in designers like Coco Chanel, in Paul Poiret, who are like, let's get rid of this hourglass shape, get rid of you know, all the corsetry and stays and embrace the modern woman. But time is not a linear progression because then this happened. <laughs> and the new look, while it is objectively so luxe and beautiful and uses a lot of fabric and is very decadent and became emblematic of the post-war years, you know, the hard times are over, it is also sort of kicking and screaming back to like, corsets and stays and all the things that I think followers of Chanel and Poiret were like, wait, I thought we got rid of that. And um, so this is sort of the scene in Paris. You can keep this image on in your noggin when I tell you about Gabby Agian, who was born in Cairo in 1921. Uh, she grew up in a very rich family. Uh, show cat, please, if I do, if I say anything wrong, raise your hand. <laughs> um, but she was raised in a very wealthy family uh, who had a seamstress who would come to their house and make her whatever she wanted. So she was very sure of her tastes and her style. And um, she was uh, also in her childhood. That's where she met her husband, Raymond Ra Ramond, uh, and they married quite young in 1940. And then after the war, they moved to Paris. And it was in Paris where she was like, oh my God, I forget the exact quote, but it's something to the effect of like, these women look shackled. I mean, they, they, they look like they were sort of going back in time. And you know, the interesting thing is, I, I have to be fully honest, when I first heard about Chloe, I think the word that someone the way that someone framed it to me where they were like, yeah, it was the project of a rich housewife who was bored. And that is certainly what a lot of people thought of Gabby, you know? They were like, she grew up wealthy, her husband was very wealthy, and I, you know, she said something to the effect of, what am I supposed to do, have like lunches all day? And she, she decided to work, which was really frowned upon, especially given that she had the means to do it, she wanted to make sure women had more clothing options. And so she worked with designers and seamstresses to make, and you know, you can see this, this is a picture of what is in the next room. Um, these are just like loose, uh, that, that dress over there is um, a wraparound dress, sorry, Diane von Furstenberg, but she launched the company in 1952 and it was right away about like loose shapes, big pockets. Um, there are a lot of 
you know, wool business suits. They're just like practical stuff for the everyday woman to wear. And uh, Dr. Romano will talk about this more, but what's really fascinating is Chloe was sort of splitting the difference between couture, like ordering something made for you bespoke and ready to wear, going into a store and just buying something off the rack that's already there. Basically, you could buy something. She was, Chloe was the first brand, I believe, to do um, designer ready to wear. Like you could buy it pre-made and they could adjust it to you. And you might be thinking, huh, Gabby's name is not Chloe. Why is it called Chloe? Well, I think uh, there was some hesitation about putting her family's name on the label, but really, uh, Chloe was just the name of a friend of Gabby's and she loved the sound of it. She thought it was beautiful. She thought it was round. It was so quintessentially French. And also this woman, represented a potential client. So it's kind of this fascinating move of naming a company after the wearer rather than the designer. Uh, and it also kind of represented this collective model because she hired a lot of different designers who would come and go and work with her until this one designer came on board, this young man from Germany, and very quickly he became the only designer and his name was Karl Lagerfeld. <laughs> and this was sort of Karl's big break. And he worked at Chloe for two decades and then came back again in the 90s, like 92 to 97. And I mean, you can see this stuff in the next room, but it's just incredible. And it's sort of a nice evolution and a continuation of the spirit of Gabby. It's playful, it's fun, it's loose. I mean, a lot of these dresses were hand painted and yeah, it just became such a part of the brand sensibility and part of Lagerfeld's sensibility. And so, yeah, after he left the brand for the second time in 1997, he said, uh, you know, they're going to have to hire a really big name to replace me. And he assumed that the big name would be in clothing, but it was actually a big name in music, Stella McCartney. 25-year-old baby Stella McCartney, who had just graduated from fashion school, had really big shoes to fill. And um, I mean, look at those incredible dresses. She took the brand to a new place using no, and right from the jump, she, was, she didn't use leather, feathers, or furs at all. And she said this made, uh, this was good for business actually, that people wanted it. And you can see McCartney sort of embraced like a different version of what French girl style meant, which is funny because she's not French, but it was very like, this is, this is at the uh, 1999 Met Gala. They were wearing these, she and Liv Tyler were wearing these matching shirts, but it was kind of this like, she brought an element of, of cheeky, sexy fun. And you can see this, this like era of uh, McCartney is coming back in style on, um, people like Bella Hadid. And um, yeah, then the next person to take over the brand was Phoebe Philo, who was McCartney's assistant, another Brit. And she took the brand into this um, more romantic French gamine sort of style. And it, the, under these designers, under Stella and under Phoebe, you don't get the idea of the, the male dictator sort of deciding what women wear. You get women designing together. There are talks about how you know, they would all try things on there in the workroom because they were the clients and they were the designers. And so it's painted as this very egalitarian, you know, women design collective, you, you know, just you and your friends trying on clothes if all your friends were extremely beautiful, wealthy white women. Um, <laughs> but I love, I, I love the direction that, that Philo took it and sort of, yeah, iterated, iterated on the, on the looks. And then there were, um, a whole bunch of other designers. I believe there were two more Brits, a Swede, one actual French woman, uh, Natasha Ramsey Levy, Le Revy Ramsey, uh, Ramsey Levy, Natasha Ramsey Levy was the, the French designer. Uh, until there was, um, in 2020, Gabriella Hurst, who's Uruguayan, and uh, she recently stepped down, and now there's a new designer at, at Chloe. But you can see it sort of becomes this um, greenhouse, this sort of launch pad for all these different designers, and you can see their take, like this is Gabriella Hurst's take on the brand. They're all sort of working within these similar styles, these similar motifs. It's French, it's feminine, it's bohemian. It, there are lots of different 
words you could use to describe what Chloe is, but it really has ended up being more conceptual um, of a brand beyond, um, yeah, beyond, beyond the founder and beyond any one designer, which is so interesting because I think we're so used to that now, like, oh, there's a new creative director of Louis Vuitton, there's a new creative director of Gucci. We're used to these like designers cycling in and out, but this was a very new iteration of that in the history of 20th century fashion. Um, and with that, we'll pass it on to a very different case study, Claire McArdle. Oh, whoops, oh yeah, that's you. We're good. This I passed to you. I'm going to sit so I don't block our, our view. Can you hear me okay? Um, so thank you so much. I'm ex so excited to be here. Thank you, Jenna. Thanks to the Jewish Museum. Thank you, Avery. Oh, yeah. Um, and so um, I always like, I'm going to take us back in time a little bit and kind of start at the start. And I'm all, I like to start these talks. I'm just curious, like, how many of you have heard of Claire McArdle before tonight? That's a good, we have a good, like, inside baseball group who, like, you're, you have more hands up than most. Um, but don't worry. If you haven't heard of her, you will. And um, I think the thing to know is if you got dressed today, you have Claire McArdle to thank for much of what you put on. Because a lot of what she created in the 1930s and 40s really laid the foundation for modern, ready-to-wear American clothing. Um, this is our, our lovely Claire. She, this is her in 1945. And this dress at the time was actually rather revolutionary. Um, it wasn't structured. There were no corsets. There was no bodice. Um, it had a belt at the waist that you could adjust to your own size so women could sort of adjust it. And I always like to point out, what is she doing with her left hand? <laughs> Pockets, baby. We all, all, we still want them, right? Um, Claire was already fighting that good fight for us back in the 20s, 30s, and 40s. Um, she always tried to get her bosses to let her put, before she became the boss, uh, pockets into her skirts and dresses. And one reason when she's like, men look really comfortable with their hands in pockets, why shouldn't we? Um, but also, I think Claire really understood the psychology of it. She understood that sometimes you need something to do with your hands. And like, you just need a place to put your hands. And she really always thought about the experience of being a woman moving through the world. That was her perspective. Claire, from a very early age, always thought about what it was to inhabit a woman's body. And so rather than coming from the societal gaze or the male gaze, Claire was always coming from the female gaze. She was really about um, women dressing for themselves and for what they wanted to be in the world. And as I'm about to tell you, she really did create, in a lot of ways, the understanding of what a modern fashion designer is today. Um, she was born in 1905. She grew up in a very rural town in Maryland. She had three older brothers and earned the nickname of Kick because she knew how to defend herself against her three brothers. And um, you have to remember at this time, there, there really was no such thing as ready to wear. Ready to wear was in its infancy. You could get a few things off the rack, but for the most part, you either made your own clothes through patterns or memory, or if like Gabby or like uh, Claire, you had a middle class, upper class family, you brought in a seamstress. And Claire, from a very early age, was fascinated by clothes, and she was also fascinated by the ways in which women's clothes were different from her brothers. And she liked to say, you know, why do women's clothes have to be so delicate? You know, a tree, it, like, uh, clothes could be practical and sturdy. And she once said, some clothes, pretty though they may be, just got in the way when you were climbing a tree. And so she was a, she was a bit of a tomboy, but she also loved to dress well. And she was coming of age in the 20s, so corsets were out the window, you know? And she was starting to um, talk about these underclothes, like the crinolines that made your skirts explode. And she was living in New York in her 20s. She came to Parsons. And she's like, you can't get into a cab. You can't get into an elevator. Um, she also hated being cold. So here she is in the 30s wearing men's tweed on a boat going over to Paris. And this was well before this was you know, widely acceptable. And why was she on a boat to Paris? Because that's where all the fashion inspiration came from. There really was no such thing as the New York fashion world at that moment. New York was effectively a manufacturing hub cranking out stolen mostly or licensed sometimes 
Parisian clothes. And after Parsons, she got her first job where she was asked to do that. They said, go to Bergdorf's, go look at the French room, sketch what you see, and then come back here and we're going to copy it. And Claire hated it. And in the book that I'm writing now, I have access to her letters. And at the time, she wrote her parents saying, I don't want to do any more of this designer stealing. And so she would sit at a park bench and sketch her own designs and try and pass them off to her bosses as her own clothes. And I think that worked for a little while, but not for long. And then she was hired by a 7th Avenue manufacturer called Townley. And at Townley, Claire got to become a designer. And she was still told that she needed to copy Paris. But what she started to do was she started to wear her own clothes. She was always dressing for her own needs as a modern woman in New York, a career girl. Literally that idea of I need to go from you know, morning to night in the same dress and get on the subway. And her breakout design happened in 1938. It was called the monastic dress. And the only reason it was sold was because she wore it to work one day and accidentally bumped into the buyer from the department store Best & Company. And what was so revolutionary about this dress is this one manufacturer said, my God, it has no front, it has no back. Where do you zip it? It had no structure. But what she was doing was not only solving a problem for women, but for ready to wear, sizing, even today, how hard is it to get something that fits you, that, that's the right size. So she was figuring out ways to make clothes that you could fit to your own body. And you can see George O'Keefe in the middle. She was a fan. So she was getting these very independent women artists and, and models, and Lauren Bacall loved her clothes. And over the years, Claire iterated on this design. So here it is later in her collections as a halter. But the idea was you could really fit it to your body. That dress was a smash success. It sold out. No one knew she made it because her name wasn't on the label. Because at that time, designers did not have their names on the labels of clothes. It was either the department store or it was the manufacturer. So Claire asked for and got something that was incredibly unusual at the time. She got her name on, stitched onto the label in the 1940s. And one of the things that Claire started doing at Townley was she was moving very far away from the haute couture idea. She wanted to harness mass production. She said, I belong to a mass production country where any of us, all of us, deserve the right to good fashion. And so she was thinking about how to make something that was both beautiful, but that could also be washable, it could be wrinkle free, um, anybody could wear it, and it could be mass produced. And some of her inspiration came from her own life. She loved to ski, she was very active, and she thought the pragmatism of like ski buckles made a lot of sense, so she'd start to put these industrial elements onto her clothing, which was very new for the time and she embraced the modernism. I love this detail because she loved little brass eyes and hooks that she would put on the side of her dress that were very industrial. But if you look at it, there's really no embellishment to this dress. It's all about the fabric, the construction, and one simple little detail. And the other thing about it is, Claire lived alone until she was almost 40. She married very late. Marriage wasn't important to her. And she always put her closures on the side or in the front because she said, you may live alone and like it, but if you can't get your zipper up and you wrench out your arm, that's just terrible. So here she is on a boat again, and she's having to do these, still having to do these Paris trips. And at some point she's like, I hate these steamer trunks, they're really dumb, why am I carrying this big luggage? So she came up with this wool jersey, black knit set of interchangeable five pieces. Today we know it as separates, and it literally is uh, the foundation of the fashion industry. Back then, her boss was like, I don't know what you're doing, we can't sell this, and it took a very long time um, to, for buyers to pick up on this idea of interchangeable fabrics. Um, she, you know, I know, very sporty. Here is this moment where she didn't like being cold, I think I've said, <laughs> and um, she called this her supermanhood, but today what do we call it? We call it a hoodie. I also noticed the, like, the belt bag, it's big, but like 
were all my kids wearing this today? Um, and she loved to swim, and she made a joke that, you know, the Gibson girl barely could take a stroke because whatever she was wearing would fall off of her. So <laughs> she was very smart about harnessing mass production of fabrics, and she started using these wool jerseys um, in, her in her swimwear. Um, the 40s came, Paris shuts down, we're at war, and there are massive rations on fabric. And a lot of the male designers at the time were kind of annoyed by the, con the constraints. She thought it was pretty fun to have a constraint and be creative within it. And um, at the time, ballet slippers could be leather. And so this is Claire working with Capizio, basically starting what we now understand to be our ballet flats, right? Um, and then here she is also starting to understand her business savvy. She's starting to patent her work because she's understanding design stealing and her legacy. Um, here she is, her clothes are on the cover of Life magazine in 1943. It's basically a bodysuit and leggings. Um, and she was so famous in her lifetime that she was one of the only designers on the cover of Time magazine at the time. And she was beloved by women all across the country. She was being marketed uh, outside of the major uh, cities. And she also started to understand branding, right? I love this font so much. I love her, <laughs> I love her label. And she starts doing um, licensing her work. She starts doing baby clothes. She starts doing sunglasses. She starts to become the multi-hyphenate designer that we understand today. And that didn't exist at the time. I mean, you still had to have a male signature to get a checking account. You still had to have a male escort to get into restaurants. So for me, part of my interest in Claire and her story isn't just what she was inventing, but what it meant to do that at the time. And we like to talk about iconoclasts, but I think on this panel tonight, you'll hear about a lot of uh, teamwork. Claire wasn't alone. She was at the center of a constellation of really extraordinary fashion women in the 30s and 40s. It was mostly women. And they were building not only the brands and the labels, there was Eleanor Lambert inventing uh, the publicist and doing New York Fashion Week. There was Dorothy Shaver, who became the first woman to head Lord and & Taylor. And so there was a really extraordinary group of women in the 30s and 40s who built American fashion. And then the war ends. You saw this one already. But I love this one just for how painful it looks. <laughs> Oh my God. So I was like, cue the villainous music. Here comes Dior. He's back. <laughs> because they were getting cinched back in, right? Everything Claire fought for, to have a woman feel free and open in her body, we're going right back to this thing. He called it the wasp waist. He was like, how small could you get that waist? And Claire got into a media spat with the French. She was angry. She said, why are we going backwards? What are we doing? And a famous French designer at the time named Jacques Faf said, fashion is art. He said this in 1954. Art is creative, and men are the creators. There will come a day when all great designers are men. <laughs> to which Claire responded, ah, men. They never understand the way clothes feel. Their lines are often harsh and masculine. And when Chanel gave them soft, feminine simplicity, it was Chanel they loved. Someday, all designers will be women. Um, she got branded the gal who defied Dior in this article, written by, notice, a young Betty Friedan. <laughs> and Betty was noticing the way the door was closing shut on women again in the 50s, after the freedoms they were experiencing in the 30s and 40s. And she highlighted Claire for that reason, because she saw her as being defiant. And sadly, um, Claire died very young. She died at 52. She had what we now understand to be a genetic predisposition to colon cancer. At the time, they did not understand that. And so she died in 1958. And um, it's interesting, though, because Claire used to say good ideas earn their survival. And if you talk to designers today, many of them will say that Claire McArdle is part of their design inspiration, whether that's Anna Sui, who I've talked to about her, or Michael Kors, or Tori Birch, who reissued. Um, and was inspired by Claire McArdle. And so, you know, my interest in this book, which will come out in 2025 from Simon & Schuster, and that's the plug, um, <laughs> it's really not about the provenance, it's not about the history of affixing her label back and her name back to the clothes she created, but really 
about this movement of women, this time that was really always about much more than just clothes. And I think you will pick it up from here. <laughs> Um, yeah, really, such a good segue. There's so many overlapping themes, I think, between Claire McCardell and Mary Mecco yeah. and just like all of the designers that we're talking about today. Um, so first of all, just thank you to Jenna and Avery and the Jewish Museum for inviting me to participate in this event and to think again about Mary Mecco, the Finnish label, as a brand made both by and for women. It's right there in the name Mary Mecco, after all, um, because Mary Mecco means a little dress for Mary, meaning a dress for everyone, every woman, old or young, short or tall, pregnant, bicycling, or as it, you'll see at the end of my presentation, protesting. Um, so the first member of what I like to call the sisterhood of Mary Mecco is Army Ratia. Um, who you see here on the left in one of the company's unisex Jokopoika striped shirts, which they're still making and selling today. Ratia was originally born in Karelia, which was then part of Finland, which is now mostly in Russia, in 1912. And she studied textile design in college, but due to wartime restrictions, she really began her working career as a writer. She returned to her textile training in the late 1940s when her husband, Vilio, bought an oil cloth and textile company called Printex. Um, and he really like, needed her help to turn the company around. At that time, they were mostly selling you know, printed cotton cloth for housewares like tablecloths, napkins, curtains, um, but it wasn't doing very well. Um, Post-war Finland was in a really fragile economic position um, they were trying for a really rapid expansion of industry and a return to international exports. Um, and the Ratias believed that Printex could be part of that you know, post-war boom. But first they had to find the right use for their product. Um, so in 1951, Army founded Mary Mecco, seeking a new way to showcase that product in the form of dresses. Um, and you can see dresses from their first fashion show here. Um, at this stage, all of the company's fabrics were hand printed at their factory outside Helsinki, and it actually wasn't until 1973 that they got, um, you know, mechanized industrial print screen printing technologies. Um, and it's interesting, by convincing women to wear dresses that were in the same patterns as were on their tea towels and tablecloths, the Ratias were really on the leading edge of a retail trend that we still take see today the lifestyle brand, um, when your home and your fashion and your mode of entertaining could all bear the stamp of the same style. So Army initially um, designed several of the patterns for the fabrics, but she soon called in reinforcements. Um, more women who were eager to design dresses that, as the New Yorker would later put it, aren't feminine interpretations of the suit as uniform, but dissent from the idea of sucking it in and putting on a show. <laughs> yeah. Very McCardell. Yeah. Um, so the print most synonymous with Mary Mecco um, was created by one of those early hires, Maya Isola, who you see here, um, a graduate of Helsinki's Institute of Industrial Arts, as Army Ratia had been before her. So the Unico, or poppy pattern, um, which was launched in 1964, was a direct challenge to Ratia's offhand statement that Mary Mecco would never do florals. <laughs> <laughs> um, and Isola is also responsible for an astonishing like 500 plus other Mary Mecco pattern designs, including classics like the Kivet dots. I know I have a Kivet parka, and I saw somebody else in the audience who has one too, because they it was one of the patterns that um, uh, Unico, Uniqlo had in their collection. Um, she also did the Meluni ovals and the Loki waves. Um, and you can tell just by looking at these patterns, I think, that they were designed with a big paintbrush or big scissors. And Isola often worked on the floor, as seen here, um, in both paint and cut paper to come up with these patterns. Um, 
Another really important designer um, in the Mary Mecco Pantheon was Vuoco Escalin, or Vuoco as most people refer to her, and she worked for Mary Mecco from 1953 to 1960. She's the one who designed the Joka Poika sh shirt, um, the striped unisex smock-like shirt with aluminum buttons, that's how you know it's authentic, um, that also became a uniform for many male fans of the brand uh, during the 1950s and 1960s. Um, she also designed that freehand painted stripe that they're made in, um, and many of Woko's patterns, including that stripe, use what is considered a fault in most screen printing, which is when two colors overlap and create a third. So even if they're only printed in two colors, it looks like a three-color stripe. Um, in the early 1950s, most of Mary Mecco's dresses had been considered sort of houseware, like just something you'd throw on in the neighborhood. Um, but her larger scale patterns um, suggested something sort of big enough to be worn outdoors and help to propel Mary Mecco into a more kind of public demonstrative fashion space. Um, after a falling out with Armi Ratia over credits, um, Vuoco went on to found her own brand with her husband, Anti Nermis Niemi, um, and they are still making clothes together today. Uh, after Vuoco's departure, um, Ratia hired Annika Rimala, who was trained as a graphic designer to design both clothing and textiles. Um, Rimala increased the volume of the dresses, often pairing wide skirts with tight shoulders and necklines, and even introduced a jumpsuit into the line. You know, everything was dresses until you get to the jumpsuit. Um, and the interesting thing about Rimala is that she always designed the fabric and the dress together. Um, a habit that you can observe in the um, scallop pattern zip front dress that she's wearing in this image where the fabric has to be placed in a certain way to integrate with the zipper, et cetera. Um, and we'll get to some other patterns that she designed later that have color blocking at the hem or the neckline only, um, allowing Mary Mecca to do a kind of minimalism but still have some of their characteristic screen printing techniques. So for most of the 1950s, Mary Mecca was a Finnish-only brand. Um, but I think one of the reasons that we're talking about them today is the splash that they made when they came to America and how integrated they were with a lot of American fashion trends, um, particularly in the 1960s and 70s. Um, the company's values and products really aligned with what was happening in American sportswear and American homes, and a lot of the American fans essentially became brand ambassadors. Mayor Mecco didn't really advertise, but they had a lot of um, you know, free advertising from their famous clients. And the story that, about how they came to America is kind of part of that story. In 1958, the American architect Benjamin Thompson spotted the textiles at the Brussels World's Fair, where the young female exhibition guides at the Finnish Pavilion wore the company's dresses. Um, he was always on the lookout for fresh products for his Cambridge store design research, and he began importing Mary Mecco in 1958, leading to international distribution, press coverage, and brand expansion. Um, this is the, Thompson was part of the Cambridge firm, the Architects Collaborative, who were eight partners who sought a new collaborative model for architecture work. And four of the partners were married couples, the Harknesses and the Fletchers. Um, and two of the earliest TAC projects were modernist subdivisions um, in the Boston suburbs um, that would accommodate the TAC partners and their growing families. And Thompson's wife, as well as his female partners and his male partners' wives, all wore Mary Mecco and had Mary Mecco in their houses and basically like lived a Mary Mecco lifestyle in <laughs> suburban Boston. Um, the senior partner in TAC was Walter Gropius, the German architect and co-founder of the Bauhaus School. Um, Gropius emigrated to the U.S. in 1937 and built a modernist house of his own in Lincoln, Mass., for him, his wife, Issei, and their daughter, Ati. The Gropius house is now in the National Register and open for tours, and if you visit the house, you will see Mary Mecco potholders in the kitchen, and on the bed in the primary suite, as you can see in this photo, a Mary Mecco dress purchased at Design Research and worn by Issei. She added the fringe at the bottom, I guess to make it more like party friendly. <laughs> 
Um, and Issei uh, served as a de facto publicist for Gropius and the work of the Bauhaus School. She was sometimes called Mrs. Bauhaus. Um, and like the more famous weaver and Bauhaus graduate, Ani Albers, Issei Gropius also made out her own jewelry out of hardware store parts. She also wrote essays on fashion, one titled, What Does the New York Woman Look Like? Um, and as this quote here from her oral history in the Archives of American Art shows, both Mr. and Mrs. Bauhaus understood the power of dress as part of the whole design Gesamtkunstwerk. But while Ben Thompson spotted Mary Mecco and brought it to Cambridge, it was really Jacqueline Kennedy who introduced it to a wide audience. Thanks to her December 1960 cover appearance on Sports Illustrated wearing the brand. She was pregnant with JFK Jr. at the time, so she needed looks for the presidential campaign that were cheerful, approachable, and flexible, as well as capacious enough to accommodate her changing size without calling attention to it, because you know, it would not have been discussed that she was pregnant, but she was pregnant. Um, so she bought eight dresses, um, all from design research, and the one on the cover was designed by Vuoco. Um, and that was what led to the falling out with Army Ratia. Um, Vuoco wanted more credit for being kind of the woman who dressed Jackie Kennedy, and Army Ratia wanted all of the designers to be subsumed in the Mary Mecco brand and have it be um, a generic. Um, so, you know, Vuoco went on a trip to India and came back and said, I quit. <laughs> um, but at Jackie Kennedy wasn't the only first lady who wore Mary Mecco. Both Lady Bird Johnson and her two daughters also wore the brand when they were in the White House. So, you know, pretty high places. Another really important international milestone for Mary Mecco was a multi page feature story in Life magazine in 1966. And I think this shoot really um, showcases the themes that we're talking about here today, that kind of go anywhere, do anything ethos. Um, shooting Mary Mecco for life introduced the photographer Tony Vaccaro to the model Anya Leto, who later became his wife. Um, she's the one holding the yellow umbrella in this photo. Um, Vaccaro also shot her wearing the same dress uh, as the one owned by Issei Gropius, standing in front of the Gropius Design Pan Am building in New York. Um, and I love the contrast of these two images, you know, Mary Mecco in the Finnish countryside in the rain, Mary Mecco on Park Avenue. It could really go anywhere. <laughs> um, fashion correspondent Eugenia Shepard wrote um, of uh, Mary Mecco's introduction to New York um, at uh, the Design Research's new New York City store. What Lily Pulitzer has done for socialites, a charming, fresh-faced Finnish woman, Armi Ratia, has done for intellectuals, given them a uniform. The way Ratia puts it, the Mary Mecco is for women whose way of wearing clothes is to forget what they have on. Her best customers are not only intellectuals, but wives of intellectuals, like architects, designers, and professors. And as I wrap up here, I just want to note a couple of those intellectuals and the kind of cultural power of the ongoing Mary Mecco sisterhood. On uh, June 20, 1966, the urbanist Jane Jacobs spoke out against the building of a new library for NYU and the potential destruction of Washington Square Park. And peering at some blotchy black and white images of this historic event, I noticed something distinctive about the hem of Jacob's dress. Um, right there. Uh, a lighter colored scallop wending its way around the bottom like the brick border on a garden plot. So where had I seen that border before? Then it came to me. At the Brooklyn Museum ex exhibition, Georgia O'Keeffe, Living Modern, against one wall, the curator Wanda Korn had lied up, lined up a series of O'Keeffe's long sleeve full skirted cotton dresses from, as Elizabeth already mentioned, Claire McCardell, but also from none other than Mary Mecco. So it kind of blew my mind that Jane Jacobs and Georgia O'Keeffe had the same dress. <laughs> um, and it's the Vario dress with a print and design by Anna Karimala, both purchased at Design Research as tags in um, Georgia O'Keeffe's archive show. So 
basically, who could be more desirous of forgetting what they had on than women like Jacobs and O'Keefe, who had so much work to do? And who would better understand their needs, you know, skirts for riding horses or riding bicycles, pockets for notebooks and sketches and pens, than powerhouses like Rimala and her boss, Army Ratia? So Mary Mego may have had this modest start as a producer of tablecloths, but it really became a product that women around the world needed. So thank you. Thank you. Um, I think I'm the only one without references to the to that wonderful Georgia O'Keeffe exhibition, <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> she didn't wear Chloe. Um, thank you, Avery, um, and to everyone who organized this uh, lovely event. I'm so happy to be here. Um, so we're going to travel back to uh, the immediate uh, post-war years in France, um, where, uh, fr uh, which was in basically disarray, um, politically, economically, culturally. France was, you know, coming out of occupation and attempting to uh, put back the pieces of of all of these uh, different areas, including the you know the, the its hegemonic position in the cultural arena, and that included um, fashion. Fashion was incredibly important to France's um, uh, economy, but also its national identity. And and central to that identity was the haute couture industry, um, which I'm sure you all know about. Uh, a very very expensive, um, luxurious, regulated system of made-to-measure clothing. So the, the image to the left uh, is, I think, the first or the second um, issue of Vogue that was published after the war, and you're seeing what would, what would have been very typical, illustrations of gar uh, women models dressed in haute couture garments surrounded by fragments of uh, you know, these rarefied, very familiar fragments, fragments of, uh, of Paris's spaces. Um, and that was what was in the press. Ready-made clothing uh, was not considered um, important in, uh, in fashion. Uh, it was, uh, um, haute couture was, was at the center and, and that defined what was considered fashionable. Um, so you're looking at, to the right, images of Gabi Aguillon from the same time period, the 1940s, um, projecting a very different uh, type of femininity, one that is kind of free and light um, and more casual. Uh, she wasn't designing clothing uh, yet in this moment, um, uh, but she was just moved, she had just moved to Paris, as Avery um, uh, discussed, with her husband, and she was involved in a circle of intellectuals, artists, um, political thinkers, leftist political thinkers mainly, um, and some people in the fashion industry. So these you know, ideas that were being um, shared and discussed really enriched what she would later do um, in 1952 when she decided to um, start a ready-made clothing, clothing brand. Um, and she, wanted it to be very different from this uh, ideal of haute couture. She wanted it to be relevant for more women than could afford haute couture. Um, and she wanted it to reflect herself. She wanted it to be relevant for a woman who was active, who was maybe professional. Um, and this was a really interesting moment for women in France, having just, in 1944, won the right to vote Finally, um, and and yeah, the the this uh, well, we'll talk about that in uh, in this uh, in this presentation for sure. So, as France, uh, as the couture industry attempted to rebuild itself, uh, largely, you know, kind of thanks to. Uh, Christian Dior and his great success with the uh, new look silhouette, the Ligne Corolle, um, the ready-made industry also saw this as a really um, good moment to, to advance, to develop. 
Um, there had always been ready to wear in France, even though the French don't really like to admit it. Um, but as I said earlier, it wasn't um, it wasn't what was what, what people were um, uh, looking for. Um, so much like in uh, post-war Finland, the rush to modernize was felt in all areas in, in, in France. Um, they were, they came away from the war with this feeling of, of backwardness, of needing to compete with more modernized industries, um, including in fashion. Um, the American sportswear industry, as we learned earlier, had uh, grown really sophisticated and successful, thanks to Claire McArdle um, and other, other uh, women uh, fashion professionals. Um, and so France looked over abroad, notably to the US, to figure out how to have a successful ready-to-wear industry um, and to really grow and produce at the, you know, the same uh, um, speed and um, volume. So this was done in part through productivity missions um, that were uh, organized by the American government, the Marshall Plan, the um, European, uh, the Economic Recovery Program, uh, in all fields of industry. Um, there were two important pr uh, missions uh, that pertain to the women's wear industry in, taken in 1953 and 1955. Um, and here are some of the sort of resulting materials uh, in you know, fashion writing and um, The image to the left is of a, um, a garment, not by Chloe, by a, a designer, a manufacturer called L'Empereur. Uh, and it's a really important fashion shoot in Vogue, uh, Vogue Paris um, of American um, French models only in ready to wear in you know, New York, in this center of, of modernity, um, uh, wearing only ready to wear, so kind of uh, enacting this reversal of the Marshall Plan and sort of saying to the world, we make really good ready to wear. Um, look at us, it isn't only New York. Um, so there were very few ready to wear brands. Chloe was one of them who were doing something that was really different. Um, and, and yeah, Chloe was led by a woman, which was an incredible, uh, an incredible thing. Um, all of these sort of what what came from this moment, the late 40s and the the early 1950s of trying to figure out what ready to wear would look like in France, um, is something that uh, Chloe really um, encapsulated, which was this kind of in between um, made to measure and uh, and couture. It wanted to retain the, all of the best um, aspects of French cultural production and identity um, while also being um, industrially modern. So uh, Chloe, who offered, um, in certain cases, uh, a choice of fabric um, and uh, for the consumer to, to, um, uh, to communicate her, her size, uh, um, uh, but all, but with with industrial meth methods, um, some hand finishing sort of was was this you know idealized this this in between nature. Um, um, the missionaries went uh, didn't only go to study production techniques; they also um, learned how important it was to brand and to communicate with the press to um, you know to make sure that things were being pictured and that things were being sold. And, and again, this was all kind of revolutionary and new in the French fashion um, press. So here are some examples of um, editorials that, show, that, that lead with ready to wear, ready to wear Congress Paris, bravo la confection française, confection was, was the, um, the kind of older term for ready-made production, prêt-à-porter, is a, is a literal translation for, um, uh, to, uh, for ready to wear. So a, a kind of um, 
highlighting the, 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 the way in which French ready to wear was really um, born from uh, American, um, American ideas. Um, so here's, so also at this time, um, many women in the early 1950s uh, were at the heads of French magazines um, for the first time. And it, I think is no coincidence that, there, that at this moment, um, they started to picture more accessible and practical ready-made garments. Um, Elle, in particular, which, which was founded in 1945, was really instrumental in this, um, in this uh, process. And you're looking to the right at um, the founder, Hélène Lazareff, uh, and to the left, one of these um, many di uh, uh, one of these articles that had opened up a conversation, a dialogue with consumers, um, uh, basically educating them on on how ready to wear was um, beneficial to their active um, professional lifestyles, and even surveyed readers. So here are some of the early Chloe um, uh, editorials um, that, that reflect these new discourses in, in fashion, this new shift in, in a system of values away from the privilege, the rarefied haute couture to start to privilege industrial modernity, um, you know, urban speed and, and living. Um, the, uh, the, um, the example in the center is another um, nod to the Brussels Exposition. Um, uh, and here is a model wearing this wonderful um, knitted shirt dress um, in the unfinished space of, of construction. So, so, so paralleling um, this new modern industrial um, fashion production with this, uh, you know, this World's Fair, the first since the, the Second World War. Um, and the image to the, all the way to the right uh, is uh, an editorial about ready to wear for rushed people. <laughs> they were always, always rushing around in, in these editorials. Um, one um, area uh, where Chloe really stood out um, and made an impact uh, was, as Avery pointed out, um, uh, privileging designers, creative, independent designers who um, were behind the, the, the clothing. So you might consider um, Chloe to be a really early kind of design incubator. Um, Aguillon was uh, instrumental in a lot of the designing and did, most, and did all the designing in the beginning, um, but she then kind of took a step back and uh, worked with the, the, the creative talent of the moment um, and put them on display and named them. Often they were named in the press. Uh, when Karl Lagerfeld took over in the mid-60s, he was always pretty much always named in the press. Um, and I call this uh, stylisme, this new kind of ready-to-wear that would really take hold in the 1960s in France, which was led by designers. Um, and so Chloe kind of rivaled um, this new landscape of, of ready-made design in the 1960s. Um, Chloe was also one of the first um, ready-made brands to have fashion shows. So again, aligning this type of clothing production with a, a couture tool, um, but stood apart in that, you know, as opposed to uh, couture shows that were often very stoic and hushed, she, uh, Aguillon held hers in um, bustling cafes and, and restaurants, the Café de Fleur, the Brasserie Leap, um, which were alive with people and life, so making a statement about um, how that clothing should, be, should also be lived and, and viewed. And also they were in the um, Saint-Germain-des-Prés in the left bank, so another uh, 
kind of doing what Saint Laurent did in, in the mid-1960s, but making a statement that, you know, where, while the couture industry was in the right bank, um, we were, you know, this is the kind of fashion that is more appropriate for the, um, the younger uh, generation, the Bohemians. Um, and Chloe uh, was, you know, it, intrinsic to uh, its brand identity, you know, throughout, now, certainly today, um, was the Parisienne. And this uh, image of a, um, a typically Parisian woman um, that was enumerated in the fashion press, as you see here, um, clothing that was uh, made for a French woman, but who any person could step into. And that was largely also thanks to um, the name of the brand, Chloe, this quintessential French name, but also an anonymous kind of French persona. Um, and again, about the wearer. It is not signed by a male couturier or, or, or a specific designer, but it's about the wearer. Clothing um, became um, suitable for a you know, multifarious fem female identity, whoever that was. And that's so something that I think the brand still trades on, even though um, it does have kind of specific um, visual uh, ideals. Um, so I chose a Chloe garment um, uh, uh, for the cover of my book. Um, and it's a really, it's an editorial that I love, an image taken by Fouli Elia, also an Egyptian um, expat in France, who, uh, who was close with the, the, the uh, Aguillon. Um, and it encapsulates the way fashion in post-war France, led by Ready to Wear, and brands like Chloe, um, were instrumental in this shift uh, of, you know, conceptions of fashion um, and a new relationship between the city of Paris, here this, uh, you know, suburban, um, heterotopic, uh, not very rarefied uh, place, fa um, women and clothes. Um, So the clothing was conceived to be um, more comfortable and more freeing than, than the new look and um, a lot of what was being made in haute couture um, thanks to you know, structuralist um, straight garments, um, to certain fabrics, to the use of jersey, as you see here, some, uh, examples of wool jersey and silk jersey. Um, and this um, uh, uh, this movement, um, uh, both metaphorical and physical, um, that was at the you know at the heart of the the, the clothing production, um, is highlighted so beautifully by the um, the photo shoot uh, all the way to the left by by William Klein, um, showing a, a kind of typical. Um, softly tailored Chloe suit, um, picturing a model moving, moving through space. Um, the use of, you know, the wrap silhouette, um, certain types of, um, you know, silk crepe, uh, wool crepe materials, unstructured mini dresses, separates, t-shirts, uh, skirts, um, larger sleeves, all of these were design choices meant to, um, yeah, facilitate a, an active, a more active um, feminine. Chloe um, also did tailoring, so there was both the dressmaking and the tailoring. Often it was a, a, a soft tailoring, again, um, and uh, in these early years, Different designers would, you know, there were different designers working at the same time, and different designers would um, design these different, uh, uh, you know, one designer might focus on coats, 
and others on, on dresses. So it was, you know, even though there were male designers, quite collaborative um, with Aguillon always there working, um, you know, alongside in various ways. Um, Karl Lagerfeld is, uh, you know, kind of at the head of Chloe for, from the late 60s, he's pretty much in charge for, you know, about 20 years. Um, these are some examples of his really colorful creative universe. He is, um, you know, given his background in couture, um, he is a, uh, a good way of understanding the sort of the bridging between these two um, systems through Chloe um, in, in terms of the types of uh, really luxurious fabrics uh, and other supplies that, that he used that were coming from couture suppliers often. Um, the, the hand finishing, uh, the beading, many of these, um, these textiles like the Astoria dress were, were hand painted. Um, and then in the 1970s, um, I think, uh, you know, the clothing becomes quite simple, um, often without, without seams and zippers, um, many of his, um, his silk, uh, um, and cotton creations were, you know, based on, you know, pure geometry, two triangles or two panels of fabric. Um, there were um, kind of modular, well, uh, adaptable components. Um, in 1977, uh, a, a line of, I think they were called waist liners where women could um, uh, adjust the size of their, of their dresses through um, you know, this, this waist panel. Um, uh, but also showcasing his, his technique, his uh, um, affinity for the bias cut, um, looking back to the 1930s, like many designers are doing at this time. Um, and really, this, this moment of, of modernity, modernism in, in fashion. Um, maybe I'll stop here. I've got a few slides from you know when the, the women reign again in the, from the late 90s, but Maybe I'll stop here and yeah, yeah. These, we can. These are great as background. Thank you so much. Okay. I'll keep, I'll keep our panel discussion short because those are all so great and you can probably like see all the connections um, and similarities between these designers. But I have to say, so I'm wearing a suit right now, not because I think that uh, feminizing menswear is the way to dress women, but because this is, this is, this is my great reveal. Uh, this suit is, says, Claire McArdle oh. <laughs> inside of it. Wait, wait, wait. But it's not, a, she, didn't, she didn't do this. This is not, well, okay. My larger question <laughs> is why do some of these brands survive and some don't? And the part B, specifically to you, Elizabeth, is like, why is there a Claire McArdle suit that clearly... I, I don't think is this the from the 50s. I don't know what you, can, can you like uh, I mean, Antiques Roadshow this right it's now? It's so interesting because I'm seeing a few um, people I know through Instagram out oh. in the audience tonight who are really good vintage, I feel like there's some vintage label. Yeah, someone could. Who could really, so. So it could be from a bunch of different time periods, right? So there were moments where, okay, so Claire McArdle, when she died, Townley tried to keep her label alive probably for about a year, year and a half. In fact, one of her good friends, an extraordinary designer in her own right named Mildred Oreck, took over the line and, and tried to... But what they quickly learned was that they, a, at the time, didn't have a lot of models for what it looked like to keep someone's name going um, in a ready-to-wear line in America and have another designer, but also they just didn't know how to replace her. She was somewhat irreplaceable, and so they made the decision to let the line die. But there have been moments over the years where people have come back and put Claire McArdle into, like I think Lord and Taylor maybe, or I don't want to malign them. I don't know if it was Lord and Taylor. Um, but yeah, there are moments where she came back and people tried to use her label and then she was shut, they were shut down, I think by the family and others who had the trademark. Yeah, and so why, why has Marimekko lasted and why has Chloe lasted? 
I'll ask you out first, Alexander. We'll go in order. Yeah. Well, Mary Meko has definitely had some ups and downs. Um, the like the heyday of Mary Meko and the the period that I mostly focused on was kind of like 1951 to 1980. Um, Army Ratia died in 1979. That was also the year that um, design research went out of business. So that was kind of a, like a one-two punch for the brand. Like their main American distributor went out of business at the same time as their founder died. And the family tried to keep the company going under their own steam. Her, the, the Ratia's son, Ristomati Ratia, um, has his own line and, and like was a designer. Um, but basically like, in the 80s, styles changed and made, you know, boxy, heavy cotton dresses not very in vogue um, at the same time as they lost their creative force. So the company almost went bankrupt in the late 80s and was finally rescued in the early 90s by a woman, I wrote down her name, um, named Mika Ihamontola, who was a big fan of the brand. And she kind of got them back on track um, and really focused mostly on selling it in Finland and selling the housewares and kind of, you know, keeping it close to home. Um, so Mary Mucko kind of disappeared from the U.S. for many years. Um, and then it finally comes back in the early 2000s. They open a store in Japan. Um, they start e-commerce. They have a store in New York again. So there's kind of, I think, this gap in like the American experience of Mary Mecco. When was that? When was its return? Um, in, the, about. in the mid, mid to late 2000, okay. like 2000s. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and their licensing, which I think is an important thing too. Yeah, they like, like the, yeah, they like. Because I have a unique low Mary Mecco dress. Right. Yeah. They licensed earlier. Um, a lot of people had the Bow Boo sheets, which are the Mary Mecco sheets with the cars and trucks on them. Are people nodding? I'm sorry, I like, can't see anyone <laughs> in the audience. Yes. I mean, I, I, whenever I post Mary Mecco, people are like, oh, I had those sheets. So, and those were, um, those were a license in the 1970s with the American manufacturer, Dan River. And if you see any of those sheets, you should get them because they like last forever. They're amazing. <laughs> um, but yes, as part of their sort of re-entry into America, they opened their you know like own boutique in New York, and then they also actually did a whole series of collaborations. I feel like I own something from like every one of these. <laughs> it's a little bit embarrassing, but um, Converse, Banana Republic, Target, Uniqlo, Clinique, and Adidas. My money, the best ones have been Uniqlo, which this dress is from, and also Adidas. They have some great stuff. But I feel like it also kind of represents the, everything we've been talking about, the movement from, like, doing all those partnerships hasn't diminished uh, Marimekko's clout at all. And I think in the early days of Ready to Wear, there was this huge pan, I mean, Pierre Cardin ruined himself by putting his name on everything. You could buy, like, a, you know, Pierre Cardin hair dryer. Like, they had everything. And now, I, you know, it seems like ready to wear is so ingrained that that doesn't diminish the brand or bother us in any way. No, I mean, I think they really use those collaborations to reestablish their name as something that like young people should have heard of. <laughs> but it is always really interesting, um, you know, because the core Mary Mecco thing is basically, you know, the patterned dress, the very stiff patterned dress. In a lot of the collaborations before Uniqlo, they basically like tried to make everything but that dress so that like you could only get a Mary Mecco dress at the store, at their store, but you could buy a Mary Mecco beach towel at Target. So, I mean, I think this is always sort of the tension of those collaborations. It's like, how do you make your product more um, economically accessible without diluting the thing that people originally came to you for? Yeah, it's the same question. How does, why is Chloe still this yeah. brand you see advertised everywhere now? Yeah, well, it's, it, it is really incredible because, um, you know, I mentioned that Chloe wasn't the only um, ready-made manufacturer in the 50s or the 60s, of course, but um, it's the only one that has survived, mm. except for one that's called Vey, but nobody other than French people know about it, um, which is remarkable. Um, and some, you know, there's still Sonia Riquel and a few other names from the 1960s. Um, but I think that, yeah, incredible design talent. And there were always some 
there were also some low periods as well, and you know, late 80s, 90s. Uh, but when Chloe, um, you know, Chloe makes really beautiful bohemian flowy party dresses, and it's kind of really strong in that market now. So um, they um, and blouses. So. Uh, yeah, they're they're kind of a mainstay, I think, and also supported by a really powerful um, uh, again brand identity and campaigning. Uh, but they were purchased at some point, right? Yes. What is I don't the remember. name of the Shokat, Do you remember who purchased oh, I'm Chloe? I'm bad with this. Uh, now it belongs to Alicia. Uh, okay. Alicia. Yeah. Right. 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 So, so yeah, supported by a, a you know a powerful uh, company, um, yeah, 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 global port, yeah, company, yeah, which I feel like is such a um, another way that like these brands survive, right? You get like bought up by one of the three mega corporations that owns almost every fashion brand. Well, and I think it's interesting about Claire because she was not her own label; she was working for a Seventh Avenue manufacturer. And she ended up getting to become a partner in that company. You know, she worked her way up and really um, became part of that brand and was the brand. Um, but then when she was gone, they didn't know what to do about it. <laughs> yeah, it's just, it's also really interesting the different varieties of like, do you need to lo learn how to sew? In Claire's case, it's like, yes. In Gabby Agnon's case, it's like, no, <laughs> and it, it's um, and do you need to put your name on the label? In some cases, yes, it's really important. In some cases, no, it's actually a strength that your name is not on the label. It's really proof that there's no one sort of textbook for how to create a successful brand. But I guess and this this will be my last question, and then we can open it up. We'll keep it very short for like audience questions. But I guess in doing your research on your respective designers, what were your takeaways from the way they conducted their businesses and the ways they did their designs. There's um, an extraordinary anecdote that I read about Claire um, working in the warehouse in 7th Avenue and there was a young designer who was getting ready to start her own line and she was leaving and they all feted her and then after everyone left, Claire came out and Claire sat with her and that young woman recounted what it was like to have the Claire McArdle sit with her and not only give her her blessing but encourage her work. And, you know, I think there is, this was a moment of women supporting women, you know, Parsons, Claire went back and started with design education and critiques. And there was something about that mentorship and that desire to like, it's not a zero sum game. Like we, we all rise if we all work together. She very much espoused that. I think, I think the thing that I love about Mary Meko and, and comes through, you know, in doing research is like, sticking with the thing that you're good at. Like there's something kind of anti-fashion or outside of fashion of, in Mary Mecco. Um, you know, just like these boxy dresses with giant patterns, like a lot of other companies don't do that. But that meant that like they could make those dresses with variations and, and like when you get into it, you can see, you know, which designers did what, you know, at which time. But but that like just sticking with this thing that you're known for, even as other types of fashion rise and fall, like can be a strength. Yeah, I guess similar to um, the Chloe aesthetic. Um, but I will say that, and I don't, you know, I'm not very good at understanding the business dynamics, but she did co-own, Aguillon co-owned the brand um, at the start with someone, uh, a man named uh, Jacques Lenoir, who, ostensibly, you know, was more on the business end of things while she was freer to um, think about design and um, facilitate those, those designers, um, which is often, you know, how brands stay successful when there is that space for creativity, um, and often it's a gendered space. Um, and, yeah, but I will also say that, um, you know, the power of branding, especially um, and I was really lucky to write about for this exhibition um, catalog this the, this more recent period of Chloe's history, led by these four wit British women designers who um, were you know all of these images of friends, everyday women um, in this kind of yeah 
circle of fashionable camaraderie, you know, inviting consumers to join them and to buy into this kind of lovely idea. Um, and it's something that is ambiguous enough that most people could try and jump into, and I think that has helped them uh, yeah. stay afloat. <laughs> Um, thank you so much. Yeah, so uh, questions. We'll, we'll keep it short, but please. Uh, you say ready to wear, but what is the price point compared to haute couture, which let's say is 5000 then how much would yeah, that in, be? In Claire what McCardle's would... case, early on it was, it was much cheaper. I mean, I don't know what the, it, the exchange would be from now to then, but like her dresses were selling for, you know, $30, which in 1930 wasn't cheap. But then when the war came, her most popular style, the popover, you could get for three ninety five. So it was one of those things where the price points were very, um, were variable. And those adjusted both with the marketplace and with the types of clothes that she was putting out. What about Gavin? Yeah, Chloe was very ex is and was very expensive. So kind of, you know, a slap in the face almost to this discourse of accessible ready to wear. Um, sometimes it, you know, rivaled couture prices. Uh, not always. And of course, I don't I'm not an expert on this whole period of time. Um, but in, you know, s give communicating this message that the ready-made is fashionable. It did a lot to, I guess, valorize, you know, that production and the lower price points uh, that were available. And just a tiny thing I want to add on to that. Um, the philosopher Gilles Pavetsky says that the advent of ready-to-wear was, in some ways, the egalitarian movement in fashion, but in other ways, it was the beginning of hyperconsumption. Yeah. You know, it was like you just bought more shit as soon as you could, you know, as soon as you hit the 60s. And so the other thing is like, yes, this, this ready to wear was expensive, but it wasn't as expensive as, you know, the one gown that you got, you know, for the year, you know, it was like a different sort of uh, level of investment. Like our brains didn't work the same way before ready to wear. Um, so I think I noticed in the timestamps um, a lack of the 80s. So I'm curious, <laughs> what happened in the 80s? <laughs> I, I can't speak to that. Claire was gone. But I, I might just venture neon. I don't know. <laughs> um, well, the brief was to, to do post-war, so that's... And to speak for five minutes, which I don't think any of us did, um, you really should go downstairs or next door and look for yourself because Karl Lagerfeld made some incredible, really whimsical, very humorous, um, embellished and sequined dresses. I can that tell were more you, angular. I can tell you very quickly what happened in the 80s. I'll keep it really quick. But basically, the 80s was the birth of like, like, women went to the office. You know, they're like, I don't need this fucking dress. Like, I'm an adult. It was and Working Girl, Molly it was, Griffith and Working Girl. It was girl. Working Girl. But not only was it Working Girl, it was, you know, Dress for Success. That handbook came out with like a women's version. And there was this idea that like, well maybe women should dress like men and like stick to basics and stick to neutrals and sort of emulate uh, a more serious wardrobe. And obviously, you know, you could still have fun and wear neon on the off hours. Um, but there was this idea, and, and notoriously, there was this moment where the fashion press tried to push a new look for the 80s, like with mini skirts and frou-frou, they called it frou-frou on the runway, and then it didn't sell, because women were like, when am I going to wear this? You know, I, I don't understand when I'm supposed to wear this. And in the 80s, this was a huge deal. The bottom fell out of the fashion industry. They were like, oh my God, what do we do? Like, we, we can't dictate the fashions anymore. And this is when the tail started wagging the dog and consumers were like, no, I'm not going to buy whatever you tell me to make. You're going to make what I need. And this is the birth of trend forecasting and the world we see today of basics and like reliable clothes so that following trends and following fashion has become arguably, in some ways, optional. This is why Avery has the best podcast of 2023, <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah.
<laughs> one last one. That is true. It is the best podcast it really of all time. Is. <laughs> um, so I have a question about this image of Chloe, where it's this like young hottie who's like out at the bars with her friends, <laughs> wearing like these gorgeous pieces. And I'm just wondering, as we're entering this, like what feels to me, I'm about to turn 25 in like two weeks. Um, I'm about to. Happy birthday. You know, I'm feeling like um, we're, our relationship to like gender and our relationship to class and work and clothes and all these things are shifting. Do you think that this image and this like on the go woman who's like super hot and has a million friends and all the time in the world to wear all these gorgeous things. Is that sustainable? Like it's because it feels eternal and yet also not approachable to me. I don't know. Does that make sense? Is this a sustainable image? I mean, to be a hottie. I just feel like it, co it, it goes back to the idea of like, is fashion a linear progression? Because the answer is like, we've had this fight before. And in fact, they were over that feminist mainstay pockets. Mm -hmm. In the beginning, like, in beginning, when is the beginning? But women used to have like huge pockets, you know, to carry around like your sewing and like little bits of cake you were saving for later and like shit. All your keys. All your keys. Cause so you were like, keys. yeah, you, were, you, you needed these practical pockets. And actually the move to get rid of pockets, yes, to some degree it was like inflicted on women by male designers. But in other ways, women were like, I don't want to walk around with bits of ribbon and pieces of cake in my pocket. Like, I want to go have fun. I don't want to be always, like, yeah, I don't want to be some, someone else's, I don't want to be my, my family's walking, you know, first aid kit and repair service and everything. And that was the movement, that was the beginning of the handbag. Was this, like, there were these little bags called reticules, and it was for women who were like, I don't need much. I'm going out, I'm having fun. All I need is a lipstick and a little bit of money and like my house keys. And that was liberating. You were like free from the home. You were free from these responsibilities. That was a sign of a liberated modern woman was to like not have pockets. And then suddenly we're like, wait, 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 no, no, we want this. And so it like goes back and forth over time. Um, and so I feel like it's just a, like, I think you're totally right. And I think we're confronted with sort of iterations of that same eternal problem of like, what's empowering? Mm -hmm. I don't know. <laughs> I'll just say that I think it's a really good thing that fashion imagery has, you know, increasingly diversified and so there are other types of, you know, representations of, of gender and identity out there. Um, yeah. Even at Chloe. Yeah, <laughs> noticing time. <laughs> I just want to thank each of you for sharing so generously tonight. Thank you to everyone for coming. We might be running out of minutes to see the show, so um, try and do that or come back anytime. It's so um, good. Thank you so much to um, Avery, to Elizabeth, to Alexandra, to Alexis. Thank you, everybody.